Some people know it as Black Wall Street. Others called it Little Africa. But what it was really named was Greenwood. The Greenwood community in Tulsa, the historic black community, was started in about 1906. There were black lawyers, black dentists, undertakers, teachers, black millionaires. 35 blocks of sheer black audacity, sheer black excellence, sheer black success. We had everything. We had restaurants, hotels, theaters. We had a community full of people that loved you, people that wanted to see the best in you. And on May 31st, 1921, everything was destroyed. My name is Tyler Lockett. I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, drafted by the Seattle Seahawks, picked 69 in the 2015 draft. Growing up in Tulsa, if I could be honest, it really wasn't much to do. There wasn't any restaurants or anything like that on the north side. People went to the Boys and Girls Club or the Y. What's up, man? What up, Demario? How you doing, man? Good to see you. Yeah, I see you too. Appreciate you for doing this, man. Being able to grow up in Oklahoma, being able to experience the things that we experience, I tell people all the time, they have no idea what Tulsa is like. Right. I tell them that Tulsa is a step behind. Yep. So now, as you and I know, there's a North Tulsa, which is black, and there's a South Tulsa, which is white. South South Tulsa is like a major city. They got malls, they got hospitals. We don't have a hospital. Our people on the north side are poor, so they don't have great transportation. So that's just a recipe for disaster. It may not look like it now, but 100 years ago, this was one of the most affluent black communities in America. And this is where I'm from. When you look at the events and everything that took place in 2020, it makes you want to go back and dig a little deeper in history. I want to be able to learn more about Black Wall Street, which was known as Greenwood. I want to be able to know what made that community so great, what made people want to come to Tulsa, Oklahoma, because I, I truly believe that we can get back to that place. People forget that Oklahoma is one of the newest states. It just became a state in 1907. And before that, it was Indian territory. But there had been efforts at the end of the 19th century to turn Oklahoma into an all-black state. The other thing that's a little bit unusual about Oklahoma generally is the presence of what we call the, the freedmen. For lack of a better phrase, we might call them black Indians. After the Civil War, these black folks got land, and land was really an accession to wealth. And as the city boomed, Greenwood did as well. This was a community that really blossomed into this economic and entrepreneurial hub for black folks. And so it was Booker T. Washington who was credited with dubbing the Greenwood District Black Wall Street. Yeah, so this, this is Boogie T. Washington. This is the school that everybody wanted to go to. My dad played on this field. My mom played here. I think the, the one thing that's in my head right now is just I wonder what Boogie T. would look like. I wonder what everything would look like around it had it not got taken away from us 100 years ago. Until 1910, 80 to 90% of black people lived in the South. And after 1910, black people began to disperse in what is known as the Great Black Migration. That black migration began to populate areas that had not received many black bodies before then. So it created a powder keg of tremendous tension. This was a period in which lynching was occurring broadly throughout the United States. In addition to that, Birth of a Nation, the celebrated film by D.W. Griffith, shown in the White House by President Wilson, 1915. The whole idea behind the film is to demonize and dehumanize black folks. 
Birth of a Nation also furthered one of the great taboos of the 20th century, which was relations, particularly intimate relations between black men and white women. You have these so-called race riots that are taking place across the country. And all of these dark winds are blowing through Tulsa as well. The closer we got to the spring of 1921, racial tensions are getting ratcheted up higher and higher and higher. It was such that only a catalyst or a match, if you will, to throw on the embers was needed. That incident occurred on May 30th, 1921. It involved two teenagers, a black boy named Dick Rowland and Sarah Page, a white girl, 17, who was an elevator operator in a prominent downtown building called the Drexel Building. We don't know exactly what happened, but we think what happened is this. As Dick stepped onto the elevator, he tripped. He shot out his hands to break his fall. He probably caught Sarah on the shoulder she was startled, she screamed, and he ran out of the building. And so immediately the story got around that she had been sexually assaulted and abused, and that Dick Rowland was the culprit. And it's a fiction. Sarah Page will refuse to press charges. Dick Rowland will be exonerated. But at that point, just the mere rumor was enough to set off white men, ostensibly to protect their communities, but also to reinforce the vulnerable positions of black people and keep them under their rule. Just before dawn on June 1st, a 16-year-old Greenwood resident named Bill Williams, he looked out across the railroad tracks and he told me that it looked like the Milky Way. And what those flashes of lights were, were the cigarette ends glowing of the thousands of whites who are armed, who are carrying matches and cans of gasoline and kerosene. House by house, building by building, restaurant by movie theater, by tailor shop, the destruction of Greenwood proceeds. Explosive devices ignited, bombs dropped from airplanes. It was an extraordinary fiasco. The Greenwood neighborhood was almost wiped off the face of the earth. We know that at least 1,250 homes were destroyed. Many black folks spent days, weeks, months living in tent cities after the massacre. Most historians and scholars believe that somewhere between 100 and 300 people were killed. We'll never know exactly. It is an extreme example of all of this hidden history in the United States that we simply don't talk about. Hey, Mother Fletcher. It's an honor to be able to talk to you. Could you talk to us a little bit about what happened on May 31st? Well, I saw people running and getting shot and fall and bleeding. Saw smoke and fire and heard guns shooting. And we heard someone come through the neighborhood saying to get out of town that the white people were killing all of the black people for us to leave town if we wanted to save our lives. Not only my family, everybody in the neighborhood was gathering up and leaving, as we were told to do. I didn't know why, you know, that was happening, but it was. Day and night, I think about what happened a hundred years ago. Yeah. Welcome to Vernon. Grandmother Greenwood, the basement is the only thing we have on Greenwood Avenue that survived the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Wow. One of my oldest members told me that people hid in our basement, but I didn't know how plausible it was until I saw this picture. In this picture, you see ash above every window, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong, I thought that too. Look closely, you see ash above every window except the back window where folk were able to hide. 
So this is the portion of our basement that was not burned. And in this section, you see this wall. The reason why the fire didn't spread is because this wall, this is a double-sided brick wall. No fire coming through here. The fire's on this side, Tyler. People on this side. You may get hot, but you're not gonna burn. And that's the window frame that didn't have any ash over it from the picture that we saw. Every time I come into this room, I, I, I really can feel the prayers of folk who were praying and them not knowing if they would be next. Hearing about these stories and learning these stories, being able to talk to Mother Fletcher, mm -hmm. man, it really hits home and it means a lot. I always said that we were so far behind in Tulsa, but it's almost like I want to stop saying that because we were so far ahead of everybody. Yeah, we were. <laughs> we were so far ahead of everybody, and it's just, it was taken away from us to where we're still suffering. Mm -hmm. Honestly, when I look at this, it's just, it brings a lot of different emotions. And as people are starting to learn what really happened, I also think it's important for them to also know what took place after. It wasn't called a riot by accident. You had insurance claims that to this day have gone unpaid because of the use of the word riot. The city created what we call a campaign of willful neglect. In the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, they wouldn't pave streets, they wouldn't provide plumbing. They were able to utilize eminent domain to take the highway and put it right through the heart of Greenwood. And so even today, we are essentially building from a deficit. National Geographic magazine did a study and they came up with the figure that there would be more than $630 million worth of wealth in Black Tulsa right now. That's generations of college tuition, down payments on houses, seed money for new businesses. It would have transformed the city. No arrests, no convictions, no reparations. That's what we're fighting for. And that's why I can't say enough how much I appreciate you using your platform to help us get to your fan base and your followers to understand that this injustice here in Tulsa is not something that just happened 100 years ago. It's ongoing to this very day as long as we do not have justice, reparations, and truth. When we think about the Tulsa story, you have to think about the dark part, the tragic part, the horrific part, but you also have to think about the incredible pioneering spirit and determination of these people. These are American heroes. Even as the embers from the massacre smolder, the community began rebuilding. And that's what I call the indomitable human spirit. The question facing all of us as Americans is do we want to learn from our history? Can our history tell us anything about how we should live and work and play together today? The great late James Baldwin said, I love America more than any nation on this earth, and therefore I reserve the right to criticize her perpetually. That's the greatness of black America. So when the NFL community sees this, they're not gonna see entertainment. They're gonna see reality. They're gonna see the truth about life. Something that we can't hide from. Something that has been hidden. Or something that can't be no longer a secret. This is real life. Now, when I think about where I went to school and just growing up, to understand the history of what we had, just to be able to be on that street, I mean, honestly, it means everything now. Because I know where we came from. I know where we come from.